Lesson 2.3 is the properties of functions. So here's a bunch of definitions. I would pause the video to write down these definitions. So a function is considered increasing if as you read left to right, as your x's increase, your y's are also increasing. So an entire function can increase or you can have specific parts of a function increasing. So for example, right here it is increasing because the graph is going up and right here it's increasing because the graph is going up. Decreasing as you go left to right, as x increases, your y's decrease. So this little section in here would be a decreasing section or um, you could have an entire decreasing function. Constant, as x increases, y neither increases or nor decreases, so it looks like a horizontal line in that section. A local minimum is the lowest value in a specific interval. It's wherever your graph goes from decreasing to increasing, so it has to make that turnaround like the bottom of a parabola. A graph can have zero local minima, it could have one, it could have an infinite number. Same thing with local maximum. It's the highest point in a certain interval. It's where your graph goes from increasing to decreasing. Again, it has to make that little turnaround like the top of an upside down parabola. And again, you could have zero, one, two, an infinite number of them. You'll also hear the, hear the word relative in replace for local, so those are synonyms. Absolute maximum or minimum are the one highest or the one lowest point on an entire domain. So that could also be a relative max or min, like this graph here, or it could be like an end point where the graph stops, something like that. But it's the one point that everybody can point to and say this is the one highest or the one lowest. There could also be none. Extreme value theorem says that if you have a continuous function, which means you can draw the entire graph on its domain without picking up your pencil, there's no jumps, holes, gaps, asymptotes, um, and you have a closed domain, so like this where it has two endpoints, then you have to have an absolute max and an absolute min. Um, because it's going to stop at some point. When you answer these questions, increasing, decreasing, constant are always intervals of x. So you would say that it's increasing from negative 2 is less than x is less than 5. Whereas minimum and maximum, most of the time your answer is going to be a y-coordinate. So if they're asking you what is the minimum or the maximum, it's your y-coordinate. Because you're talking about how high or low the graph is, so it's where height-wise, which is your y. If they ask you where is it located, that would be an x-coordinate. So you would say the local max is 7 at x equals 3, something like that. Looking at graphs, we can find all of these properties that we've been talking about, domains and ranges, which we've talked about previously, and then local and absolute extrema. Extrema is the general word for maximum and minimum, and intervals for which it's increasing, decreasing, or constant. So for example, if I look at this first graph A here, I can find all of those pieces of information just by looking at this graph. So for the first two, domain and range, just looking at the graph, the smallest x I have is 0, the biggest x I have is 5. So 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 5. And then for range, the lowest y value I have is 1, the highest value I have is 6, and everything is continuous, so everything's included in between. So my range is 1 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 6. For increasing, I'm going to look and see where my graph is going from left to right and the y coordinates are increasing. So it starts at 0 and it's increasing all the way until I get to x equals 3. So I have 0 is less than x is less than 3. And then again, it's increasing from 4 up to 5. And then for decreasing, I'm going to look that as I read from left to right, my y's are going down. So that's that section in between. So from 3 is less than x is less than 4. In this case, there are no sections where it is decreasing, I mean, excuse me, where it's constant. There's no sections where it's neither increasing nor decreasing. For local or relative extrema, you're looking for, for a maximum where it goes from increasing to decreasing, and for a minimum where it goes from decreasing to increasing. It has to make that turnaround, that nice smooth curve. So for our local maximum, it's where it goes from increasing and turns around and starts decreasing, and it's always the y coordinate. So our local max is six. And then decreasing to increasing, it's here at 4, at y equals 4, and so that's our local max, minimum. For absolute, it is the one highest or the one lowest point that we can point to on the graph. For the absolute max, it is also 6 because even though it's a relative, it's also the highest point on the graph. For absolute min, the lowest point we can point to on our graph is down here at y equals 1 and everyone can say this is the one lowest. If you notice, our range matches with our absolute max and our absolute min. So a couple things to notice, increasing, decreasing, constant are always intervals of x. 
so inequalities or interval notation. And then extrema is always y values, and it's just literally the local max is 6. So go ahead and pause the video and try graphs b and e. So this one's a little bit tricky here because we have this point at 3, 1 that doesn't exist. It's a hole, which we'll talk about later on in the year, um, but it's been taken out of the graph. So for our domain, we are at 1, it's included, and it goes up to 3, but 3 is not included. So 1 is less than or equal to x is less than 3, or 3 is less than x is less than or equal to 5. So we have to take this point here at x equals 3 out. You could have also said 1 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 5, or x can't equal 3. There's a couple ways you can write that. And then for our range, same thing. This point doesn't exist, but everything infinitely above it exists. So we don't want to include 1, but we want to include like 1.001. So 1 is less than y is less than or equal to 3, because we want to go all the way up to and include 3. For increasing intervals, it's increasing here to the right of that point. So it's from 3 is less than x is less than 5. And it's decreasing to the left of that point. So 1 is less than x is less than 3. There's no sections where it is constant. There's nowhere on the graph where the graph goes from increasing to decreasing, like this one here. So there is no local max. Now, the hard one is a local min, because there is actually a place where it goes from decreasing and turns around and starts increasing. And so we might want to say 1, but if we remember what we talked about, about domain and range, that point doesn't exist, so therefore it cannot be a local min. So it is also none. Absolute max, the one highest point on the entire graph is 3. We can point to it. It's right there. Absolute min, again, it doesn't exist there. So what do we say? Do we say 1.1? Do we say 1.01? Do we say 1.001? There's not one point we can all point to on the graph and say this is the absolute min. So there's no absolute min. Now, if we filled in this point here, there would now be a local min at 1 and an absolute min at 1. But at this point, there's neither of those. So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and pause the video and try E. So in this one, again, we have a couple holes here at 1, 4, and 2, 2. So those are points that have been taken out of the graph. And we also have a vertical li asymptote line here at x equals 5. Um, we do notice that there's an arrow here, so it's going to go down towards negative infinity there. So for the domain, 1 not included is less than x is less than 2. Again, not included. or 2 is less than x is less than 5, because it never goes to the right of that vertical asymptote line. Notice all of them are strictly less thans. There's no greater thans because of the holes in the asymptote line. For the range, the biggest point that I have is less than 4, so not including 4. Even though this point here at 2 is taken out, there is another place that y equals 2 exists, and then it goes all the way down to negative infinity. So my range is just y is strictly less than 4. Increasing, there's an interval here in the middle where it's increasing, so 2 is less than x is less than 4. And then there's two intervals where it's decreasing. 1 is less than x is less than 2, or x is greater than 4, because it's going to continue to decrease on forever as it gets infinitely close to that asymptote line. There is no interval where it's constant. We haven't, none of the ones we've seen has one, but this would be an example of an interval where it's constant. 1 is less than x is less than 2 on this graph here. Um, local max, it goes from increasing to decreasing here at 3, at the point 4, 3, but the local max is 3. And even though it goes from decreasing to increasing, just like this one over here, that point doesn't exist, so there is no local min. Local max, we want to point to this one, but it doesn't exist. It's a hole, so therefore there's no local max, uh, excuse me, absolute max. And then it goes down all the way to negative infinity, so there is no absolute min as well. So looking at these graphs, being able to find all the different pieces of information, making sure for our intervals of increasing, decreasing, constant, we're answering them as intervals of x. And then for extrema, local and absolute extrema, we're always answering them as y-coordinates. A secant line is a line that connects two points on a graph, very similar to a chord or a secant line in a circle. So if you have a graph here and you have two separate points on the graph and you draw a line between them, that's a secant line. Now, we can only find slopes of lines, but we can estimate the slopes of curves given secant lines. So I can actually estimate the slope of the curve between point A and point B by finding the slope of this secant line, and that's called the average rate of change. 
In calculus, you're eventually going to make these points be infinitely close to each other, and you're going to find what we call the instantaneous rate of change or the slope of the actual curve at a specific point. But for now, we're just going to look at the average rate of change between the two points. So that's going to be the slope of this secant line. Slope, if we remember back from previous years, change in y over change in x, so y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So if you have two separate points, it's the two difference between the two y coordinates divided by the difference between the two x coordinates. So if you have a function like f of x equals negative 2x squared plus x, and we want to write the equation of the secant line containing the points 0 and x equals 0 and x equals 3, then we can follow very similar to what we would do back in like an algebra one where I gave you the equation of a line. So first thing is now I'm not giving you two separate points with the x and the y, I'm just giving you the x coordinates, but I'm giving you enough information to find the y coordinates because I give you the function. So that's the first thing that we need to do. So I plugged in zero into the function and I got y to be zero. So my first point is zero, zero. And then I plugged in three into the function and I got negative 15. So my second point is three comma negative 15. So those are the two points, the endpoints of my secant line. So now I'm going to find the slope just like I would back in Algebra 1 where I gave you two points and I asked you to find the slope. So the slope of the secant line between these two points is negative 5. This is the same thing if I were to ask you what the average rate of change of this function is between x equals 0 and x equals 3. So it's negative 5. So that's the average slope between those two points of this curve. Now, we're going to talk about finding equations of lines later on in the year, um, but we are going to use the point-slope form a lot. So if you don't know the point-slope form, it's y minus your y-coordinate equals your slope times x minus your x-coordinate, and you can pick either of your x or y-coordinates. So I'm going to do that. Um, the nice thing is one of my points is 0, 0, so I have y minus 0 is equal to negative 5 times x minus 0, and so I just end up with y equals negative 5x. And so this is the equation of my secant line of this function f of x between 0, f of 0, and 3, f of 3. The last property we're going to talk about are even and odd functions. This is very similar to the symmetry that we talked about a few sections ago, but it's specific to functions. Um, so an even function is a function where for every x in the domain, the number opposite of x also exists, and the two y coordinates are equal to each other. So f of negative x is equal to f of x. That'll look very similar to our test for y-axis symmetry, where if I plug in a positive and a negative x, I should get the same y value. And that's because even functions are symmetric about the y-axis, like something like this. An odd function says that for every x in the domain, negative x also exists, but the y-coordinates are opposite. So f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. And that will look a little bit like our test for origin symmetry, and that's because odd functions are symmetric about the origin. If you notice, there's none of these that are symmetric about the x-axis, and that is because functions would not be symmetric about the x-axis. You couldn't have one x-coordinate having multiple outputs. There is a third option, and that is neither. So if you test, we're going to talk about testing these algebraically in a minute, a function, and it is neither even nor odd, so it does not have y-axis symmetry, nor does it have origin symmetry, then it's just neither. It's neither even nor odd. It doesn't have one of those symmetries, and that's just it. So in order to test whether a function is even, odd, or neither, it's very similar to how we test for uh, symmetry, except for you only have to do one test. So for symmetry, you have to test all three types of symmetry and see which one works. For functions, they can't have multiple types of symmetry, so therefore we only have to do one test and see if we get even, odd, or neither. So if we look at this first function, f of x equals 2x squared minus 5 over x minus x cubed, we're going to use the fact that for both even and odd, both x and negative x had to exist, and then there was a relationship between the y coordinates. So to test for even and odd, I'm going to replace every x in the original function with an opposite of x. Remember, parentheses are your best friend, so I replaced every single x here with an opposite of x, and I put parentheses around it. Now I'm going to simplify it. And my result is if I plug in an opposite of x and I get the very original function back out, it's going to be even. If I plug in an opposite of x and I get exactly opposite the original function, it's odd. O goes with O goes with O. Odd goes with opposite goes with origin symmetry. If I plug in the opposite of x and I get anything other than those two, it's neither. So I plugged in my opposite of x. I simplified. Negative x quantity squared is just x squared. Negative x is just negative x. 
negative x quantity cubed is negative x cubed, and I'm subtracting it, so it becomes plus x cubed. So I notice that I have a negative here in the denominator with kind of both of them, so I factored that negative out, and so I got 2x squared minus 5 over negative times the quantity x minus x cubed. And I pulled that negative out in front of my fraction. So a little reminder here with our fractions and negative signs, a negative in either part of your fraction is equivalent to a negative being outside. A negative in both parts of your fraction, negative divided by negative ends up being a positive. So I took this situation and simplified it into this. And now I notice this is exactly my original function. And so therefore I ended up with exactly negative my original function and so it's odd. So go ahead and pause the video and see if you can test whether g of x is even odd or neither. So again, I replaced every x with an opposite of x, and then I simplified. Negative x quantity cubed is negative x cubed, so I get negative 5x cubed, plus negative x is just minus x. I did notice that both of these have an extra negative sign, so I factored them out, and so I got the absolute value of negative times the quantity of 5x cubed plus x. And then remembering my rules for absolute value, if I have the absolute value of a number, it's equivalent to absolute value of exactly opposite of that number. So those two are equivalent to each other. And then I notice that this is exactly the original function. And so since I plugged in a negative x and got exactly the original function back out, it would be even. If there were not absolute value bars, it would have stopped here and you would have ended up with an odd function. Um, and again, if it was anything else, so let's say you ended up with like 5x cubed minus x inside here, so one sign was opposite, that would be neither, because it's neither exactly the original nor exactly opposite the original. So this has been properties of functions, looking at graphs and different types of properties, as well as even in odd functions algebraically.